put in or not, but uh, if you want to, there it is. So let me begin again with a word of prayer since it feels like it's been forever. Um, <laughs> anyway, dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day. I thank you again for these students. Just ask that you just bless this class, help us understand uh, integration together, and just to make the most of the time, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, so let's get into it. We're moving on here to multivariate integration. And so, first of all, I'm just reminding you what's the definition of integration for us in Calculus 1? Remember, it's the, uh, the so called Riemann sum. And how does that work? Well, we take basically a weighted sum of the values of f with this change in x, right? The sample point we pick from, from each, the ith subinterval, right? And we let the delta x be defined by b minus a over n, and we let n goes to, uh, as n goes to infinity, of course, what happens to the delta x? It goes to, it goes to zero, right? And in that limit, we define the integral, right? This is the so-called Riemann integral. Now, <coughs> there are more sophisticated ways to define this integral in terms of upper and lower sums, but um, I really only know of one elementary calculus book which does that, and I, I think it's kind of intimidating. I, I like this definition just fine for this course, but th there are deeper theories of integration I should mention. Now, so moving to uh, functions of two variables, well the natural extension of this concept is to define the integral over a rectangle, right? So the rectangle this is a Cartesian product, so it's just the rectangle that goes from A to B in X and C to D in Y, right? And so like in here somewhere, there's a little, like a little, you know, little box, right? And that box, the, um, you know, the ijth box here, you've got that little green box, right? It is literally the, um, the, the I minus one-th X comma the ith x Cartesian product with the jth y, j minus oneth y and the jth y. So that's the, that's the i jth box right there, okay? It's literally this Cartesian product, this little rectangle, right? And if you were to look at it, its width by our construction here is delta x and its, its height is what? Its height by construction is delta y. Right? So the area of that little green box is what? Is exactly, you could call it delta A and it would be equal to delta X delta Y, okay? So the way I'm setting this up is that, um, you know, the subdivision of this, this the rectangle A cross B a, a comma B cross C cross D, it's, it's divided up into equal size little rectangles, right? Now I'm not assuming that delta X and delta Y are the same width at all, right? They're not squares necessarily, right? But nevertheless little, little rectangles. And so does this, does this seem like a reasonable definition to you? What would it be calculating? Can you guys describe to me what this sum would be? If I was so foolish as to hazard a picture of this, right? Suppose we just try to draw it based at zero, you know, with like, I don't know, let's say nine boxes or something, all right? So maybe this would be, you could envision this as you're like going from zero to one and zero to one. Well, let me make this. Let, let's let it go to, uh, let me let it go a little bit further. There, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm almost certainly going to regret that. Um, so over here is two, one, right? And if we had a, if we had a function, right, we could graph the function in the xy plane. So I'm, what I'm trying to do is in this little picture is just give you a sense of what's going on here. What, what's the meaning of this integral, all right? Because it won't be long and you guys will be asking me, well, what does this integral mean, right? Well, let's talk about that before we get too far into it. Okay, so if the surface, right, looks something like this, right? If that's z equals f of xy, right? 
then look, you can think of this as a collection of, oh, good grief, how many have I just agreed to draw? One, two, three, four, five, six, 18 skyscrapers, um, where the top, the height of the skyscraper is being set by an arbitrary sample point in each one of these little <coughs> sa sample, you know, sample rectangles. So if I'm so foolish as to attempt to picture like this one might be this high, right? And you know, you can imagine using different rules, right? And then this one's this high, this is it's gonna get really busy really fast. And then maybe this one's down a little bit. Right? And then maybe down a little bit further. And you get the idea, maybe. I'm starting to regret drawing this. All right. Well, can I can I can you let me be out of my misery? Um, I'll draw one more over here. So the, the, again, the height of the, the approximating rectangle, what is this? What do you call a three-dimensional rectangle? Prism. A prism. The height of the approximating prism, I'll take it. Um, I like skyscraper, right? Um, the, I don't know. So what, what is this integral calculating? The area under the surface, no, we, we have one vote for area under surface, another vote for volume. I, I think it's volume because what this is, right? This is the height of the, you know, IJ skyscraper or prism, right? And this is the, the, the uh, area, right? It's the cross-sectional area. So area times height gives us the volume of the of the green things here, right? So indeed, this is actually what this does is it calculates the signed volume, all right? It calculates signed volume um, under uh, z equals to f of x, y with respect to what? a less than or equal to x, less than or equal to b, C less than or equal to Y less than or equal to D. All right, that's that's what it's calculating. Just like the one-dimensional integral does what? It calculates the signed volume. Excuse me. It calculates the signed what? The signed area bounded by the curve Y equals f of x for a less than or equal to x less than or equal to b. All right. What do you think the What do you think the triple integral would mean? Well, don't ask me what it means, but how would you define it? How would you define like integral, integral, integral over, let's say, um, uh, let's use AAM. I'm going to run out of letters here. So let's say, let me use X1. Oh, I can't do that either. Rats, what did I do in the notes? Oh, I introduced Q and P. Okay, great. So A comma B. Cartesian product with C comma D, and then I'm going to throw in a P comma Q just for good measure. So what would the integral over this little, well, prism, I guess. Um, I might call it a, a, rec, a, a Q, well, it's not a cube. Uh, it's a parallel pipette, I suppose. Anyway, the integral over this volume of F of three variables. So what would you need here? DV, right? You'd have the limit. Um, Let's say m goes to infinity, limit n goes to infinity, limit k goes to infinity, sum i equals 1 to m, sum, that was m, j equals 1 to n, sum k equals 1 to, oh, my bad. I can't use k for that and that. Rats, I, this was a poor choice. What should I do instead of k here? L, all right, k equals 1 to L of f of x sub i star, y sub j star, z sub k star, delta x, delta y, delta z. That would be the triple integral. Now the meaning of it I can't tell you directly in terms of some sort of like volume, 
I mean, I suppose it's calculating the signed hypervolume under y equals f of x, y, z um, with respect to this cube. That's true. But pragmatically speaking, I like to think of the triple integral as like calculating perhaps a mass or something. Like you think of f of x, y, z as being like a density. For example, f of x, y, z could be like the mass per unit volume. Then this would be calculating the total mass in the, in the, uh, in the, in the volume, for example. Now, Shane is not wrong that this could be an area integral. How do you make this an area integral? Just drop the f, right? If you just don't have f here, you just integrate dA. Well, then it's the area, all right? And likewise here, if you drop the f and set it just equal to 1, then you calculate the volume. So both the double integral and the triple integral can be used to calculate areas and volumes if we take the special case of the, fu of the function that we're integrating just being 1. All right? All right, so you guys tell me, what should the properties of these integrals be? Like, would the integral of the sum be the sum of the integrals? What do you think? Yes. Yes? That's, okay, good guess. How about if we have um, an inequality? If we've got like f of xy is less than or equal to g of xy, right? And you integrate, and that's true over the whole region of integration. Would you get a, what do you think? Would you, we, we, we would get a, um, a comparison of those integrals, right? Why is that? Because the integral is defined in terms of a finite sum. Taking the limit of that, both of those operations preserve like inequalities and they pre preserve linearity. So like the properties of the limit and the finite sum are going to transfer over to the properties of the integral. In short, these multivariate integrals have all the properties that you know and love. Like, I'll just write down a couple. If I have integral over a region R of f plus c times g, well, it is true. That's the integral over FDA, <laughs> FDA. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm trying to make these integrals respectable. My apologies. Let's see here. Um, never found a drug it couldn't approve for money. Let's see here. Anyway. <clears throat> So you have linearity, okay? And that's also true for the triple integral. Um, and listen, let me not waste class time on writing these things out. In the notes, I have a nice box collecting all of the properties, right? On page, uh, where is it? Here, let's just look at it together for a second. You guys don't want to watch me write this stuff out, do you? So right here, this is what I'm talking about. Um, these are all the properties, <coughs> and I've written the proposition for, um, you know, for uh, the double integral, right? But it is in fact true that all of these things are also true for what? For the triple integral, right? And if you use your imagination, you can easily see that, you know, if I can do it for three, I can do it for four variables or five variables, right? I just keep adding limits and sums and rather than dividing up into, uh, you know, a grid, I, I have, you know, I need four indices for four dimensions or five for five dimensions and so forth. But for the most part, we only come up against integrations that are in two or three dimensions in this course with a few exceptions here and there. Um, so then the question then that we're naturally going to ask about this is, okay, well, wonderful, we can define this integral, <laughs> right? But are we, you b know by now, right? You know by now we're not actually going to calculate these limits, right? Right? You're not computers, so this is not the way to do it, right? This is actually how numerical integration is done. You chop it up into pieces, sample points, and add things together like that's, more or less what's done, numerically in numerical integration. But do we want to calculate those? Not even once, right? Not even once. So that is where this next theorem comes into play, which is super awesome. And it says, it says that the integral 
over a rectangle, all right, like a comma b cross c comma d, and this is no, known as Fubini's theorem, the weak form. Weak because it's for a really special region, namely a rectangle. Um, you can just do it by either integrating first in x over the x bounds and then integrating with respect to the y bounds, or you can first do the y bounds and then integrate with respect to the x bounds. So let me actually show you what that notation actually means. Let me put this away. All right. So example one here. Suppose we want to integrate over R of, let's say, x, um, we'll do xy cubed dA. All right, and here, what is R going to be? R is going to be equal to, let's do 1, 2, Cartesian product with 0, 3, okay? Then Fubini's theorem says, that we can look at this as the integral from 1 to 2 and the integral from 0 to 3. I'm going to add some parentheses to emphasize what's going on here of x, y cubed. Now, the way this goes is inside out, okay guys? So like the first bounds get paired with the first differential. So like 0 to 3, so this is the x, right? And this is the y. So we, we, we have the dy comes first as I've written it. See that? So we're first going to do the inside integral, and then we're going to do the outside integral. So the inside integral treats what? It treats x as a constant, all right? The integration is over y. So we might as well, to make our life easier, just get to the point here and say, well, x is a constant. I can pull it out, right? I can do that because x is not in the bounds. If x is in the bounds, you can't just pull x out. Okay, but x is not in the bounds. x is out of bounds. <laughs> Sorry, I'm an idiot. Um, integral from 0 to 3. You're like, we already know that. y cubed dy. So there, that, that'll be, make our life easier to look at it like that. Now, what's the integral of y cubed dy? 1 fourth all right, integral from 1 to 2, x times 1 fourth y to the fourth. And we evaluate from 0 to 3, so what do we get? Three to the, 4 to the third power is 64, 64 over 4 is 16. So lo and behold, 16x dx is what we're up against. But we know how to integrate an x, so we do that. Integral of 16x is 8x squared, I believe. So we've got ourselves an 8x squared evaluated from 1 to 2, which of course is 8 times 4 minus 1, also known as 24. All of a sudden, this doesn't seem so scary anymore, does it? <laughs> right? Like, I know how to do that stuff. I can do this, right? Right? Yeah? No? Begrudging approval? No? All right, I'm just going to leave me out to dry here. Now, we could do this the other way, though. See? It's useful, perhaps, to do this in the same example, but a different way. So, the other, so Fubini's theorem had two parts, right? We could either set up the integral first with the y integral, then with the x integral, or what? We can do first do the 0 to 3, rather the first is last, right? So the first shall be last in the bounds. So 1 to 2 is actually the first integral, 1 to 2, which go with x, right? So I've got xy cubed <coughs> dx. So I do that first, and then I do the dy. I could do it like this, just the same. And I don't need to pull the x out. I could just like leave it there and just deal with it, you know? Um, in the y cubed out. So what is the integral of xy cubed? Well, it's, it's 1 half x squared y cubed evaluated from 1 to 2. dy, I could just do that. I don't have to do that pull the, uh, pull the y out trick, okay? And then from 1 to 2, what do I get? I get integral from 0 to 3, 
one half um, y cubed times four minus one. That's the x, okay? Which is what? The integral from zero to three of four minus one is three, so you get three halves. Three halves y cubed dy. My apology for the uh, multitude of fonts that I write y with. I've got at least three distinct y's I write. I so guess you could say y, y, y. Let's not even talk about z or two. Or the s or the five. Hmm, I'll tell you what. It's amazing anybody can read anything. But somehow we manage. Now, so y cubed integrates to what? Man, I'm starting to worry about this. I feel like I made a mistake. Oh, come on, guys. Three to the four? Yeah, what's three to the four? Is it 64? No. You guys just, you just leave me out here to dry. Come on, you're just supposed to help me. Uh, I feel like I'm teaching online this morning. Good grief, come on, guys. Um, three to the fourth is what? It's, uh, notice how I made this your problem and not mine. That's part of being a good teacher is to deflect blame. But, so this should have been 91, no, 81, right? 81 over four. That is an 81 over 4. Thankfully, the 0 is, I did the 0 bound right. So instead of having a, I got an 81 over 4. Well, when I integrate, I get what, 81 over 8. Eighty one over eight. Yowzers. <laughs> Times three. What's that? Two forty three over eight. I hope. Oh, you, well, look, looking good. Looking good over here. Let's check it with this one. So, what's the integral of y cubed? It's y to the fourth over four, right? So, I've got. 3y to the fourth over 8, which I evaluate from 0 to 3, and I get 3 over 8 times 3 to the fourth minus 0, also known as 243 over 8. Hooray! Okay. Sorry about that. So this is why a, a wise calculus three instructor won't actually finish integrals. We just set them up and say, yeah, you can finish them. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Shall we do shall we do another? Let's do some more. Yeah. Let's do a triple integral while we're at it. What if we're going to uh, I guess it's example two. What if we were integrating, say, from zero to pi, integrate from zero to one, integrate from minus one to one of um, oh, I don't know. Um, Sine of z um, e to the x. Um, golly, I don't know. Um, y squared. All right, and I'm going to do the order of integration to be dy, dx, and dz. Hmm. What's up? Is this going to be zero? I don't think so. Now the meaning of this. All right, so first of all, this could be, this is a way to calculate the integral, triple integral, over the region, let's say B, of f dv, where B 
is exactly x, y, z such that what? Such that, so like, such that the, um, the, the, the bounds are linked, right? Like inside out, okay? This one goes with that. This one goes with that. This one goes with that. That's how we have to understand these. That's the notation, okay? So the, the, the triple integral, this, this triple integral I'm setting up, it would be the integration of the function. Well, you, you guys know what the function is, right? This business right here is f of x, y, z, okay? That's my function. And um, so which, what's, the, what's the inequality for, for x? 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1, right? What's the inequality for y? Minus 1 less than or equal to y less than or equal to 1. What's the inequality for z? Well, z is going from 0 less than or equal to z less than or equal to pi, okay? That's the, the solid region over which I'm integrating. Let's actually do the integral, okay? So I'll write it symbolically down here again. Triple integral over f dv is integral from 0 to pi, um, and, um, well, let me just get straight, let me, let me, um, let me show you a trick here, actually. So we, we could, we could iterate just like I did in example one, okay? But in this situation where you have the bounds all constant and the function like factors like this, it turns out we're going to just be able to multiply the three integrals that are involved. But I guess I'll, let me just go through it a little bit here. Well, I'm going to claim that and then we'll see it's true. How about that? Because um, I guess I should actually do it at least once, right? So we've got what? Sine of z. What am I actually integrating here? The y squared, right? The y squared is what goes with the dy. So you do that. Then you do the x integral, and then you do the z integral. Now, we don't usually write these parentheses, but that's the logic. Inside out, all right? Inside out. So that's the integral from 0 to pi, integral from 0 to 1. What's the integral of y squared? Well, we've got sine of z, e to the x, y cubed over 3, evaluated from minus 1 to 1, right? dx dz. Now let me, let me just put us out of our misery here. Let's not write all of that again. What is the integral of y cubed? Actually, tell you what, I'm just going to leave this as a number. I'm going to pull it out front just to emphasize what's going on here. I'm going to resist the urge to evaluate that. I'm going to leave it out front. So we get y cubed over 3, evaluated from minus 1 to 1. Then I've got integral from 0 to pi. It's a number. I can pull it out, right? Integral from 0 to 1 of, what do I got here? Sine z e to the x dx dz. But I, I could have, I'm going to run out of whiteboard here if I'm not careful. So let me, instead of writing that, let me just erase this here and write that instead as, what's the integral of e to the x? It is e to the x. So what we would have here is sine z, right, times e to the x evaluated from what? From uh, 0 to 1. That was the x bounds. Now that's just a number. We can pull it out of the integration. So we have y cubed over 3 evaluated from minus 1 to 1, e to the x evaluated from 0 to 1. And finally we're down to integral from 0 to pi of sine z dz. Right? Which, of course, is what? At this point, I probably should have just made these numbers have been less to write, but I wanted to emphasize something here. Uh, you said minus cosine, minus cosine z, evaluated from 0 to pi. So do you see what's happened here? We literally have just the, like, what's this? This is the integral of the y squared dy, and this is the integral of the uh, e to the x dx, and this last one is the integral of, you know, sine z dz. So in the case that um, the bounds are constant, we can actually just, and also assuming that the integrand 
allows for it, right? Not all the integrands that we come, against, come up against can be factored like this. I'll show you one next that doesn't, okay? Um, but in this situation, you can actually just multiply the integrals and that'll be the answer. And now what is the answer? Well, two-thirds times e minus one times two. So in other words, the answer is four-thirds times e minus one for this particular problem. Let me try to think of one where we can't factor. Let me show you what the issue is, okay? But I, I can't make it so hard that we can't do the integral either, so I gotta be careful, right? What if we're up against something like, and I'll keep the bounds super nice, like integral from zero to one, integral from zero to two of, oh, I don't know, how about one over two times the square root of um, one plus x plus y. See, now I, I can't just factor the integrand into a product of functions of x and y, right? Like I'm stuck. I just have to deal with it. And the da is inappropriate here. What should I have if I'm writing this? He says dy dx, somebody else could say dx dy, it's ambiguous is the point, <laughs> right? So, but um, you want to do dy dx? I forget what he said, but we'll go with that. All right, so that means first we're integrating with respect to y. What's the integral of this with respect to y? Well, search your heart. It is the square root of one plus x plus y, in fact. And then we evaluate, now be careful, I like to put a y equals to zero down here and a y equals to two up here when there's two variables involved just to keep myself on the level, you know? Um, because otherwise, if I'm not thinking clearly, I might accidentally put, it in, put the two in for x rather than y and that in principle could be a problem. This problem is sufficiently symmetric, it might be okay. But listen, if you partial differentiate this with respect to y, did you get back here? We do by the chain rule, right? We get one over two times the square root times the derivative of the inside function, which is just one here with respect to y. So there you go. Now evaluating, we have what? We've got the integral from zero to one of the square root of what? Um, three plus x apparently, right? Minus the square root of what? Looks like one plus x. Now can we do these integrals? I actually really like this example. <coughs> Trig sub. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Easier than that. So I can just write it down. Like this is um, two thirds, three plus, now if there were x squareds in here, I'd be right on board with you. Um, but there's no x squared, so this is just a u substitution. So like three plus x to the three halves minus two thirds um, one plus x. I mean, I can make I can make trig substitution happen. Don't worry, I'll bring it back. A value from zero to one. Now here, I don't. I, I mean, technically, yes, I could I could say one equals to x, one equals to zero. But there's not really any danger for confusion in this step, right? There's only one variable left. You know what we're evaluating, right? So then what? Well, plug it in, right? Two thirds, um, four to the three halves, minus um, uh, two to the three halves, and then minus two thirds, um, three to the three halves, minus um, one, I guess, yeah. And you could simplify that, but I really don't care, okay? I mean, I care on your homework, but not for class, yeah. I mean, you should get in the habit of simplifying these kinds of things, but. <coughs> All right, any questions? Now, you're like, well, this is wonderful, but can we integrate over anything that's 
What, what if you have to integrate over something more interesting, right? Because at the moment, I've only showed you how we can integrate over a rectangle or over a, or basically a cube, right? What if we've got something more interesting? How do you do those kind of integrals? And so that is what brings us to the discussion of there's two kinds of things. The one is something like that. You've already seen this, I think, in Calc 1, maybe. We could have a region like this, right, where you've got an A, you've got a B, you've got like, you know, Y up, Y down, to lack, to use very unimaginative labeling, the upper Y, the lower Y, they're both functions of X, right? And so you might find yourself integrating over a region like that, right? This is a so-called type 1 region. There are also type 2. What type 2 look like? Well, type 2, you've got some kind of clearly defined the right x, which is a function of y. You've got a left x, which is a function of y. And there is a you know, upper bound of, let's say, D and a, a lower pound, bound here of C, right? This is a, and the region here is there. This is a type 2 integral, type 2 region. Neither of these are rectangles, right? Well, the stronger form of Fubini's theorem says that you can calculate the integral of a function of two variables, and these functions have got to be continuous, otherwise you're getting in trouble. Actually, piecewise continuous will do, all right, but if we're going to have infinite infinities and stuff, then we need to like introduce like limiting processes and stuff, but let's, you know, let's not get too carried away in here at the moment. So how would you do an integral like over something like this? Well, let me, let me do one for you. So the, I mean, let me write Fubini's theorem here. So the theorem. This is the strong form of Fubini. Strong Fubini. I just like to say Fubini. It is, yeah, it is a very funny name. So the, inter the double, double integral over R of FDA, on the one hand, if it's type 1, you can set it up as the integral from A to B, the integral from Y down to Y up, F of XY. We do first the DX. Um, wait a minute, no. The DY. And then after that, the dx. So this is the type 1 setup. But if it's type 2 as well, you can do integral from c to d. And you do the integral from the left x to the right x of f of xy. But this time, we're integrating dx first and dy second. And so the first equality is for a type 1 region. The second equality would be for a type 2 region. If you can do both, it's simultaneously a type 1 and type 2 region, right? What is simultaneously a type 1 and type 2 region? Can you think of any? Ah, oh, man. I was robbed. I was robbed. A circle? Oh, yes. Well, that's, man, now you're making me work. Um, fair enough. A circle is simultaneously type 1 and, and 2. Um, if we have, for example, x squared plus y squared equals to 1, well, less than or equal to one, that would be a, that would describe a region R, right? And we could we could do two different things, right? We could do minus one less than or equal to x, less than or equal to one. And what's y stuck between? Well, y is stuck between minus the square root of one minus x squared less than or equal to y less than or equal to the square root of one minus x squared. Yeah. So this description is a type one description of the circle. On the other hand, we have you know we could also describe the circle 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 if that's not a thing. I don't know, what, what's a circle? I don't know, something else I just made up. Um, by complete symmetry here, you just flip the roles of x and y. So yeah, you could, you, fair, fair enough, um, good point, Sam. We could describe a circle. Um, or if we knew what a circle was, maybe that too. Um, as type 1 or type 2. But generally speaking, um, and I, I admit, I have now extended so you're like, hey, hold on a second. Hold on a second. You defined the integral in terms of a, what, uh, like a, a rectangular region. 
How, how do, wh why am I even talking about integrating over non-rectangular regions? Isn't that outside our, our definition? Fair enough, you got me. So we're extending the definition here to be to more interesting shapes and how are we, how are we defining it? Basically just by imagining taking the more complicated shape and breaking it up into a union of rectangles and we're assuming that the integral works over, is, is additive over unions. Like, so the integral of a union of two sets should be the sum of the integrals over those sets if those sets are disjoint. Or at least if they don't overlap too much, okay? So like the integral over a circle would be defined like the in, sum of the integral over little rectangles that fill it. Now you see I can't do that with a finite number of rectangles. I have to uh, understand this in like a limiting process. But that, that's what we do. Now I, I don't, don't make me be technical, but um, <laughs> you just don't want that um, about this. So we, we just have to operate slightly in, in a slightly intuitive fashion in terms of how we're defining the integral. If you guys will forgive me for that. Um, the idea is just that we can take a, a curved shape and divide it up into little rectangles. And then we know how to integrate over little rectangles, so we just add those things up. But anyway, so what do you want, what do you want to integrate? We need something we can integrate. That was example what? Three? This is three? This was example three, right? Okay. So, man, I'm scared. You, you got me worried about the trig substitution. Um, golly. Well, we're going to try to do something. We'll see how it goes. Suppose we want to integrate x um, dA over the circle, right? Let me give the name. Let me name the circle um, Bob. So integral over Bob, there. There's two ways we can set this up, right? On the one hand, we can go integral. I'm going to write both down. You guys, and we're going to decide together which one we want to do. Integral from minus 1 to 1. Integral from minus the square root of 1 minus x squared to the square root of 1 uh, minus x squared. Actually, this is a dumb problem. Um, <laughs> The reason for that is this is obviously zero. Why is this obviously zero? Well, look at the circle, right? But yeah, it's an odd function. X is symmetric over the circle. It's just as much positive on one half as it's negative on the other. So this integral must work out to zero. We should make this more interesting. Ah. Uh, <laughs> squared there, OK. <laughs> All right, fine. Now it's non-zero. But now I'm not sure I can do the integrals. I wasn't sure before, but now I'm really not sure. Um, so we've got x squared. And this, here's the funny thing, is we're setting up it as type 1 at the moment. So we do the dy first and then dx second, right? Or we could set it up like this, integral from minus 1 to 1, integral. Now this one's kind of funny because the bounds look the same, but we'll do more where they look really different. Um, Let's see here, x squared. Now I've got this time dx first, and then dy. All right. Fubini's the strong form of Fubini's theorem says that these are equal, and they both calculate this integral. I'll tell you which integral is easier to start with. What's the integ what this integrates to what? This integrates to y, right? And then if you look at the bounds, if you'll allow me just to jump to the point here, this is going to give us 2 times x squared, the square root of 1 minus x squared, dx, all right, wonderful, versus <coughs> integral from minus 1 to 1. Uh, that integrates to y, uh, x cubed over 3. Um, and so we're going to get a... Um, uh, two thirds square root of one minus y squared dy for that one. Excuse me, not y squared, but it integrates to x cubed, right? So I should have what? One minus y squared to the what? Fine, I'll write this that to the to the third power, right? Because this this integrates to x cubed over three, evaluated from minus the square root of one minus y squared to the square root of one minus y squared. So that gives us this, the, the two because of the, so I don't know. Which one do you guys want to integrate?
Pick your poison. There's that trig substitution you wanted, Sam. The one on the right does look easier. I think you're right. I mean, I think you're correct. Let's see here. All right, so let's take a stab at it. To integrate, I'm going to ignore the two thirds for a second here. So we've got one minus y squared to the three halves, and I'm going to ignore the bounds as well. Um, dy, I let y equals to sine theta. So this gives me integral of dy is cos theta d theta. One minus y squared is cosine squared theta. So when I take that to the three halves power, I get cosine cubed. <laughs> I get cosine cubed theta. My dy though is ooh ah e. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We'll try the other one. Um, <laughs> x squared <laughs> minus y squared. Maybe this one's better. I don't know. Oh, it's not much better. X equals sine theta. So this one works out to like sine squared theta. I think that gives me uh, cosine theta square root of cosine squared with cosine theta, but then the dx is cosine theta d theta, so I get cosine squared. Oh yeah, so, all right, this problem's just unpleasant. But you can do those, right? I will now use my license as a Calc 3 instructor to not finish the integral. As the focus here is, because uh, here's what students always tell me in about two weeks. I really, I understand the integration. I just, I just have trouble setting it up. The setting up is the problem, right? Setting up is the problem. Uh, yes, in this case, the integration is also the problem. <laughs> but the lion's share of examples we look at, the integration is not that troublesome. It's the setup, which is the problem. Let's look at another one here. You, you, I mean, the way these are integrated is you use the double angle identities applied twice. You have to sort through it. It's about like. 20 minutes work um, on the board. Now, maybe not 20 minutes. I'd, I'd probably do in five, but I'll make a stupid mistake. It won't be interesting. Let's not do it. Instead, let us talk about another integral. Because the setup is really what you guys need the most practice on. So this was example four. Example five. Suppose we're calculating the integral of e to the y squared dA, all right? And we're going to do it over this here rec uh, triangle. I was about to say rectangle. Good job, dummy. Me, not you. Um, one, one, right? Now, this, we can either set it up as type 1. And if we were to do that, it would look like what? 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1. 0 less than or equal to y less than or equal to 1 minus x because this right here has y equals 1 minus x, right? The y-intercept is 1, its slope is negative 1, its y equals 1 minus x. Great. Now, if we set this up as type 2, what would it look like? Well, again, 0 less than or equal to y less than or equal to 1, right? But here, the left x is the y-axis, which is just 0. I guess it's kind of the same. And, but what's the x? What's the right x? Solve this for x, we get what? x equals 2? 1 minus y. 1 minus y. Oh, man, I have, I have picked the most symmetrical examples to start. Man, this is too symmetrical. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm too symmetrical today. I used to have a friend who said that she was trying to became, she was trying to uh, eat enough to to uh, to obtain perfect spherical symmetry. That's a physicist joking about themselves being fat, if you're wondering. But um, anyway, she wasn't actually that spherical. But um, let's see here. 
where was I? So we, what do you guys think? Do we want to set this up as the integral over, um, like what do you guys think here? What should we do? I don't know if either one of these are going to be nice, but what happens if I try this? I definitely, okay, here's what I definitely cannot do. I definitely cannot do the y integral first, and you guys tell me why. That's a non-starter, right? Because you can't solve that integral. That's right. You can use power series. <laughs> Very nice, Sam. But we're not going to do that today. Um, fair enough. That's right. That is true. If you really embrace the power series, there's pretty much nothing I can write down that you can't just like, I will power series my way through this. Um, but yeah. Um, forget that you know power series. All right, so um, this is not, not going anywhere. But on the other hand, if I do integral from 0 to 1, integral from 0 to 1 minus y of e to the y squared dx, well, that we can integrate, right? Because this just gives me what? Um, integral from 0 to 1 of x e to the y squared evaluated from 0 to 1 minus y. Now, I may be stuck after that anyway because I've constructed this problem poorly, but you get the idea. Um, if I plug in 1 minus y, I get what? 1 minus y. Oof. Still nasty. Still nasty. Oof. Well, yeah. Okay, so fine. We're still stuck with a stupid integral. My, my bad. I. What, about, what was I supposed to do here to make this work out pretty? What should I have made the integration region? How to, how to fix my example to make it like a nice class example? You're like, couldn't you just look in your notes and use what's there? Well, yes, I could, but that feels like cheating, you know? So to make this work out nice, I should have made the triangle look like this, right? Because then if I had made the triangle go from like this. Oh, my, my apologies. I seem to be using the hideous Carolina blue marker. It's still not dead. But if I'd done this, then I could have done, you know, zero less than or equal to y. Um, rats. I need, I need to make this work out well. I needed this just this bound to just be y or something like that. So I needed like 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to y, I believe. Um, well, that's what I have here, right? And what x goes from what? Um, well, y goes from what? So if I had this as my region instead, when I go through this integral, if I, if I do it like I did here, instead of having this 1 minus y, I'd have y e to the y squared, which then I could actually complete the integral with a u substitution. I think this problem's in your homework, so yeah. Oh, guys, so the homework um, is not due Monday after break. It's due Tuesday after break, OK, guys? Tuesday, Tuesday after break. Another thing I should help you with the homework a little bit. You guys know, we know that inverse tangent of u, that has a known, that has a known power series expansion. What is it? Do you know? Ellie, do you know? Just the first few terms. I think that's right. u cubed over 3. I don't think, I think it's, I think it's just three oh, yeah. so for this one. Yeah. It's just and it's just the odd terms, right? If I, if I, okay, so you guys check me on this. It's in the notes, right? So my, my, here's my very helpful hint to you. One of your homework problems is about inverse tangent of something, right? So if I had like inverse tangent of xy, it would be xy minus one third x cubed y cubed and so forth and so on. Right? Now you could differentiate this. You could calculate the first and the second derivatives, 
all five of them, right? Or you can do this, and you can immediately read from this that the origin is a critical point, because the gradient's zero, and the second derivatives, fxx and fyy, they're both zero at zero. But on the other hand, fxy is one, therefore big D is minus one, which makes the origin a saddle. So that is the solution to one of your homework problems. If you did it in terms of partial differentiation, that's good, that's good practice for you, but I would like you to also think about these things a little bit, yeah? So, now the other one, the other one, this one, this one here, um, sine of three times the uh, exponential of whatever it was, this one, I don't think power series methods are helpful. This one, I think you just need to differentiate and take your medicine. It's just nasty, all right? The power series tricks don't go well here. I tried, yeah. Why is it a saddle? Oh, because the big D, which is fxx, uh -huh. fyy, minus fxy squared, uh -huh. is equal to minus one at zero, zero, so that's less than zero, which means by the second derivative test, it's a saddle. It's neither a max nor a min, but it's a critical point. If that's the case, it's a saddle point. Another way to say that is this looks like z equals to xy close to the origin. It looks like z equals xy close to the origin, and this is, this is a hyperbol hyperboloid. It, it goes down one way and goes up another. Anyway. I'll see you guys tomorrow, I guess. I hope. Maybe. <laughs>